Hey everybody, it's Derek Kilmartin from CodeOpinion.com. If you're working in a system that's hard to change, it can be incredibly frustrating. It feels very brittle, where if you make a change in one part, it causes a bug or some negative side effect in another part that you had no idea about. You wanna be able to improve your system, but how? How do you go about this when it feels like it's a disaster? There is a way, here's a strategy. The first thing to really address here is finding out what the root cause is that's making your system hard to change and brittle. Typically, it's integration at your database level. It's your database actually causing this issue. So if we just had a simple app and a simple database, you likely wouldn't have this problem. However, it more so, the way to illustrate this is if you have multiple applications, it could be a cron job, some batch job, some simple other process besides your main application. It could be just somebody going in and manually changing data directly in your database. But the key point here is that you have many different interactions with that singular schema, with that database. So who owns it? Who owns the database? Thanks to Current for sponsoring this video. Current's an event native data platform that feeds real time business critical data with historical context and fine grained streams from origination to destination, enhancing data analytics and AI outcomes. For more on Current, check out the link in the description. You want to have one singular thing in your system and your code base to own that schema. You want ownership over it because ultimately it's deciding how data is getting written to it and how you're reading from it. You want ownership. You do not want a free for all where any part of anywhere can just read and write data. And I'm making these kind of two distinct things here. As the example with writing, you're gonna have constraints about say what data can be written how, and oftentimes if one particular property's changed, maybe something else needs to be changed with it. What's a valid value? You want ownership to enforce those rules so you're setting data correctly. To illustrate this is you don't wanna be thinking about, okay, I just have one schema and it's a free for all. Rather what we wanna be thinking about is, okay, we have this part of the schema, we can segregate that and then we can have a portion of our app, whether it's independent, a monolith, it doesn't really matter. It's just thinking about, okay, within that monolith or that particular service, this is the data that it owns, it manages it. And that's kind of the first step is kind of siloing off and segregating and slicing off the ownership of what the particular pieces of the data are for the functionality. So define what the ownership is for a grouping of functionality. And that's really the first exercise of part of this strategy is really looking at your database, looking at your system. You'll know the context to think about, okay, what's an easy part that we can carve off? This isn't going to be like the core part of your system that's very complicated. You know your system. You'll know that there's part of it that's kind of on the fringes. That's important, but it's maybe not used as much once it's kind of like more referential setup data type of things like that where you're like, okay, that might be a good place where we can kind of carve and isolate this. We can isolate the schema, we can isolate the code, so they're kind of a one-to-one -one together, and we define that ownership. So just another way to visualize this, if you had a monolith, it's really just defining what these ownerships are, like I mentioned at the schema, and then segregating the code that way. So we kind of have this one-to-one -one between ownership and code to the exact piece of schema that it owns in that database. Doesn't mean that we have to have different databases, that we have to have different executable deployments like microservices. It's not about being this where you have a one-to-one. -one. It's not the physical aspect. It's more so just in code, whether it's a monolith or not, that you have code that has ownership of the schema. If you're using a relational database, this could be as simple as just as a set of tables, tables that you have ownership over. If you're using an event store, it could be a certain set of event streams. Same thing with the document store, a set of collections. It's just about having that ownership. Doesn't matter the physical aspect of it, if it's a singular database instance or multiple. So another helpful hint on how do you figure out what exactly to carve off when you're looking at your system? Typically it's data that changes together. And I mentioned earlier in this kind of the aspect of it's important to think about reads and writes differently. When you really wanna look at your database and okay, maybe what can we carve off? Look at the data and how you're changing it and what data changes together typically. Because that distinction is important because you can often segregate how you're doing your writes to some specific set of code and it manages all that state change. But typically the more difficult aspect of this is because oftentimes systems are more read heavy and they do a lot of composition. So how do we handle that? 
So to illustrate this, I'm simplifying it where you just kind of have, think about multiple apps. But again, it could be a monolith that kind of has the defined boundaries and then the schemas that they own. But I'm just showing it this way, is that what you don't want to have to do is this. You don't want one part of your system querying another database or another schema that's owned by something else. Why, you might ask? Because that's what got us into this problem in the first place. This is what makes it hard to change, even if you're only doing this for query purposes. The reason is, is because that lower database, it's owned by that lower segment of what the code is, and that's its internal implementation detail about how it persists data, et cetera. If that middle tier there or that part of the code interacts with that database directly, it's coupled to it, highly coupled to it, because it knows the data types, it knows the names of the columns, the tables, the event streams, the documents, however you're persisting this, it knows too much. Really what we wanna be doing is we wanna expose something that we can version and manage as a contract. Our database is internal. It's an internal implementation detail to the code that owns it. We wanted to find something else as a contract that we can manage to all the other consumers. So that's why we wanted to find some type of API, public API, that other parts of our system can interact with. We wanna get rid of this interaction directly with our database from other parts. Now this is a step in the right direction because we've removed all that chaos and integration at the database level. Now we just try and explicit contracts and APIs, but that's what everything now is coupled to. You're not removing the coupling, there's no magic, it's about managing coupling, and this is one way of doing it. That's really what we're doing here, is we're explicitly managing coupling on something that we can version and manage rather than a free-for-all at our database. Now, how you interact with that API really depends on your system. If you're in a monolith, it's just really as simple as exposing an interface that you inject, and that's what other parts of your system use, is that defined interface. Maybe it has to go over the network because you have some other system that's deployed separately, and maybe you're gonna use gRPC, or maybe you're gonna develop an HTTP API. Really, again, it's dependent on your system and whether you kinda of have that physical constraint or not. Now, the next step, even if you just carved off one piece, you can think about I have the kind of the three different boxes in the center as an app. They could be independent, they could be a monolith, that's not really the point. But the next step is you're gonna think about, okay, well, I have this direct API call that's in memory, or maybe it's over gRPC, the network, HTTP, whatever the case may be, and you realize, I really don't want that coupling, because you start realizing that's what this is all about. So how else can I manage that? One of the ways, if you take off one of those boundaries that, again, is more in a supporting role, you might be able to do things where you're just using messaging to provide it information that it can use later for however it needs to interact. So instead of making that API call, rather you're just using asynchronous messaging. It could be things with commands and queues, events and topics. You'll explore that more once you go around, but the general gist will be once something happens, let's say in one part of your app that you've carved off, and now you need to let the other parts of your app know that something has occurred. You can be using an event-driven architecture for that, and then it, you can have different consumers understand that, okay, this has happened. Previously, I would have been notified directly uh, via some API call, but we're removing kind of that temporal aspect of it. Now we're just publishing events that other parts of our app can interact with when something occurs. This is kind of the next step of it, but I just want to kind of give you a feel where the direction that you might go in once you kind of get down to a certain path of you start carving things off. Defining boundaries in a system is one of the most important things to do, but it's also one of the most difficult things to do. And especially if you have an existing system and it's hard to see where those boundaries actually lies. This is not an easy task. It's not an easy exercise to kind of carve something off and extract it. That's why my suggestion is your journey forward, kind of that path, uh, what you can do is look at your database, look at your code base and figure out that little subset that you can separate. Start there as that exercise because you'll learn a lot when you carve something off very small, how the rest of the system interacts with it and how you're gonna do kind of manage that coupling, how you're gonna be able to expose that API, et cetera. That really is kind of the, the simplest form of exercise to do is to try to car carve something off. Look at your database, look at the data that changes together, um, that really is revolves around kind of the same capabilities of your system and try to carve that off. That's my recommendation. If you're in this situation now and you're thinking about doing this or you have already and you've gone through an exercise like this of carving something off, 
Get in the comments and let me know. I know everybody else viewing this that's kind of in the same boat would love to read kind of the experience, what people have gone through, some tips. So get in the comments and let me know. And of course, if you want to take it a step further and actually interact and chat with people, you can join my private Discord server. The link's on the description on how to join and chat with other software developers about topics like this and software architecture and design. Again, the link's in the description on how you can join. If you found this video helpful, I really appreciate it if you can give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions or suggestions for other videos, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.